We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. That was President John F. Kennedy in 1961. I'm Patrick Moore. Throughout the years of the Apollo program, I had the privilege of presenting all the live coverage on British television. The video you're about to see will tell the history of the Apollo missions. I'm here in the Space Gallery at the Science Museum in London to tell the story. Here, undoubtedly, is one of the best space exhibitions outside the USA. And throughout this program, we'll take time to look at many of its fascinating exhibits. In 1961, Kennedy had spoken to the United States Congress. I believe this nation should commit itself, before this decade is out, to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Bold words indeed. But it was the Soviet Union that had started the Space Age in October 1957 by launching Sputnik 1, the first of all artificial satellites. It was the Soviet Union who sent the first unmanned probes to the moon in 1959 and had obtained the first pictures of its far side. And it was the Soviet Union that had launched the first man to orbit the Earth, Yuri Gagarin. Yet Kennedy gave America less than 10 years to achieve the first moon flight. Of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Apollo was born. Astronauts were selected. The original seven included Alan Shepard, but not Neil Armstrong. The investigation of the moon went on. It was again the Russians who made the first automatic controlled landing, but American surveyors followed. And um, even more importantly, the orbiters flew round and round the moon and provided detailed pictures of the entire surface. Various bogies were disposed of. The moon was not covered with a treacherous layer of dust, as some astronomers believed. The great dark plains, still miscalled seas, even though there didn't be any water in them, were firm enough to bear the weight of a spacecraft. The moon had no air, but so far as could be ascertained, neither did it contain anything harmful. Its mountainous, cratered landscape awaited the arrival of man. America had some helpers. Werner von Braun, who built the V-2 rockets at Pinamura in the Baltic during the war, was in their team, and his expertise was unrivaled. If we look above where I'm standing, there's an example of his work, an actual V-2 rocket. The lunar project started to become international, though the Soviet Union was aloof and was planning its own moon landing, even though the Russians had to abandon it when it became painfully clear that their rockets were not sufficiently reliable. But American orbital satellites became more and more sophisticated. Space lockings, space maneuvers, all went well, um, more or less. More astronauts joined the program, including three named Neil Armstrong, Edwin, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. In orbit, or en route to the moon, there's no weight. Gravity is neutralized, but fears of excessive space sickness or loss of orientation proved to be groundless. So was the fear that spacecraft flying beyond the atmosphere might be battered by meteoroids. By 1967, everything was on schedule. Then, 
On January the 22nd, disaster struck. Three Apollo astronauts, Grissom, White and Chaffee, were carrying out a ground test. They were inside an Apollo module when there was a sudden call of fire. Nothing could have saved the astronauts, America's first space martyrs, though sadly not the last. It says much for the planners and the resolve at NASA, America's space agency, that in less than two years, Apollo was once more on schedule. S4B pre-press complete. Roger. Flight booster. S1C pre-press complete. We're on into And Apollo mission is not so straightforward as might be thought. What you can't do is to take off, go to the moon, and come back in a single, uncomplicated vehicle. Takeoff is by rocket booster, and the power needed is immense. That's just all in it. Roger. OK, Fado has it up. Looks good here, flight. Good agreement. OK, booster, how do you look? That's what he looks good, flight. OK, Capcom, we're going on the ground. OK, we're going one, Capcom. The bottom part of the launcher falls away. Only the upper part continues on its way. The command module is the astronauts' space home. Once in lunar orbit, two of the three-man crew enter the spidery lunar module and descend to the moon. When they're ready to leave, they use the lower stage of the lunar module as a launching pad. Houston. Right away, Houston. Vector good. Ag five. Good Big over. over. I do you have good trust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Take out your... They rejoin the third crewman. The lunar module is jettisoned, and then homeward bound to splash down in the ocean. There is so much that can go wrong, and there's no provision for rescue if the astronauts make a faulty touchdown on the moon, or if the one ascent engine in the lunar module fails to work properly first time. Tests went on. By October 1968, 11 years after Sputnik 1, Apollo 7 was ready to fly. It was not to go to the moon. It was to take astronauts Schurer, Isil and Cunningham into a path round the Earth so that Apollo hardware could be tested. It worked well. Then in December came the first actual flight to the moon. Apollo 8, carrying astronauts Borman, Lovell and Anders, blasted away from Cape Canaveral to go round the moon. Never before had men been so far from the Earth. They were not to land, but they went into a path around the moon, and they were the first men to see the far side. It could be done, it was done. Apollo 9 was an Earth orbiter testing the Apollo equipment. And then, in May 1969, Apollo 10, carrying astronauts Stafford, Cernan and Young, again rounded the moon, sweeping low over the site where the next Apollo was to land. And here, at the Science Museum, we can see the actual Apollo 10 command module. From this craft, the astronauts orbited the moon and surveyed the site which had been selected for the first manned landing. That was to be the mission of Apollo 11. The site, the waterless Sea of Tranquility, one of the moon's great dark lava plains. That was where Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin were due to land leaving Michael Collins orbiting the moon in Columbia, the command module. But if Armstrong and Aldrin were to step onto the lunar surface, they'd have to be properly clad. On the moon, there's no air. And quite apart from the fact that you couldn't breathe, the lack of pressure around you would mean that you'd die in less than a minute. A spacesuit has to be pressurized, and it's bulky. But on the moon, you have only one-sixth of your Earth weight, which helps. Watched by television viewers all over the world, Apollo 11 took off, July the 16th, 1969.
It reached the neighborhood of the moon in three days and went into orbit. Armstrong and Aldrin entered the lunar module, Eagle, and began the descent. Armstrong brought the Eagle down manually. It was a hazardous business. There could be no second chance. As they came in, their voices could be heard all over the earth. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good, over. Roger, copy. Eagle, Houston, after you're around, angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus niner, y'all, plus one eight. Roger, you're a go to, con you're a go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. Altitude now, 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4,200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Alarm. Altitude 1600. 1400 feet, still looking very good. 700 feet, 21 down. 33 degrees. 100 feet, down at 19. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're go. Same tide. We're go. Altitude, velocity, light. In and down. 20 feet. 15 forward. 11 forward, coming down nicely. 200 feet. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. 60 seconds. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Head. 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Four forward. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Head. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. At four minutes to four in the morning, British summer time, on July the 21st, Armstrong finished his descent down the ladder. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One I have for Aldrin described the scene as magnificent desolation. Though it was daytime, the sky was jet black. On the airless moon, the sky is always black. Nothing moves. There's no wind, no weather, no sound. As Armstrong and Aldrin erected the American flag, they knew that it couldn't flutter. Walking around was interesting. With only one-sixth weight, everything happens in slow motion. But the astronauts had no time to waste. They had to set up a scientific station, be left behind so that they could go on sending back information. And they had to collect rocks to bring home for analysis.
For over two hours, they stayed on the surface. Then they re-entered the lunar module and prepared for takeoff. Houston, guidance recommendation is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Only the top part of the eagle would lift away. The bottom half, the launch pad, would remain on the moon. All was well. Eagle blasted off and carried Armstrong and Aldrin back to the command module. 1,000 feet high, 80 feet uh, per second vertical rise. Eagle Houston, uh, you're looking good at two. Ping, Zags, and Mitzvah, all agree. Right down US-1. Eagle Houston going right down the track. Everything is great. Horizontal velocity approaching 2,500 feet per second. Roger. Some 120 miles to go until insertion. They rejoined Collins, the Eagle was jettisoned, and the astronauts came home to splash down in the Pacific Ocean.
some way when those two Americans stepped on the moon, the people of this world were brought closer together. That it is that spirit, the spirit of Apollo, that America can now help to bring to our relations with other nations. The spirit of Apollo transcends geographical barriers and political differences. It can bring the people of the world together in peace. The first men on the moon were back, but there was one delay. Though it was fairly sure that the moon was sterile, could anything harmful have been brought back? Just in case, the astronauts were put in strict quarantine until they'd been thoroughly examined. As expected, nothing was amiss, and quarantining was abandoned after one more mission. Next, Apollo 12 in November 1969, with astronauts Pete Conrad, Al Bean and Richard Gordon. This time, the launch wasn't so smooth. During takeoff, the Apollo was struck by lightning. Mercifully, it did no damage, but it was a nasty moment. This time, the target area was the Oceanus Procellarum, or Ocean of Storms, the largest of all the lunar seas. There was a special reason for this. Way back in 1967, the unmanned craft Surveyor 3 had landed there and was still sitting there. On the moon, there was nothing to disturb it. The Apollo 12 astronauts were scheduled to land so near Surveyor that they could walk over to it, cut bits off, and bring them home for analysis. Needless to say, this needed pinpoint navigation, but it was achieved. From the lander, intrepid, Conrad and Bean did indeed go to Surveyor. The only hitch came when Bean accidentally turned the camera toward the sun and put it out of action, but otherwise all went well. Again, a scientific station was set up, known as ALSEP, Apollo Lunar Surface Experimental Package. There were experiments of all kinds, and all worked. Once again, the return journey was flawless. Surely nothing could go wrong next time. But it did. Apollo 13 was a near disaster. Trouble began early. The crew members chosen were James Lovell, Fred Hayes and Thomas Mattingly. But at the last moment, it was found that all three had been exposed to German measles. Lovell and Hayes were immune, but Mattingly was not, and he was replaced at the last moment by Jack Swigert. The landing site was near the ruined crater Fra Muro in the Mare Nubium or Sea of Clouds. It was to be made in the lunar module Aquarius. The code name for the command module was Odyssey. Roger. Clock start, right? Roger. Press this door, all in it. Roger. Okay, Fado has it look. Looks good here, flight. Good agreement. Okay, boost the head of look. That's what he looks good, flight. Okay, Capcom, we go beyond the ground. The launch was conventional. By now, many people were starting to become rather blase. Booster, how do you look? We look good, flight, we go. Okay, Fado. We're go, flight, looks good here. Got it, Looks good, flight. Okay, Econ, GNC. Looks good, flight. Looks good, flight. Okay, Sergeant. Looks fine. Through Max, Q, and we go, flight. Roger, booster. Go for staging, Capcom. Confirm and board out, flight. Roger. Staging, flight. Roger. Flight, fighter trajectory confirmed staging. Roger. Flight booster, then board out was way early. Okay. Flight confirmed, uh, number five engine down. Right. Booster, you don't see any problem with that, though, do you? Uh, negative, not right now, flight. All the other engines are go. Odyssey had to be docked with Aquarius. This, obviously, was very much of a precision operation. Right here, understand hard dock, good deal. Okay, I can uh, I can see the S4B now at the hatch window. 
But when Apollo 13 was 178,000 miles from Earth, there was a sudden drama. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion. Okay. For a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Oh, we've had a problem here. Fine, guidance. Go, guidance. We've had a hardware restart. I don't know what it was. Okay. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. You see an AC bus undervolt there, guidance? Or, uh, ECOM? Negative flight. I believe the crew reported it. We got a main B undervolt. We may have had an instrumentation problem, flight. Roger. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. There'd been an explosion in the command module. The spacecraft had lost almost all its power. Part of the vehicle was blown out. It was a desperate situation. Brilliant improvisation, courage and skill saved the astronauts, though of course the lunar landing had to be abandoned. Using the engine of the lunar module Aquarius, the Apollo went round the moon and came home. Though there were all sorts of emergencies. It was a salutary reminder that space travel is risky. Had the explosion happened on the homeward journey, the astronauts would have been doomed. They would no longer have had Aquarius. Okay, copy that. Farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. Okay, LOS in uh, a minute or a minute and a half. Uh, an entry attitude, we'd like Omni Charlie. And welcome home. Thank you. I recall, Captain, that when I spoke to you on the phone, you said that you regretted that you were unable to complete your mission. I hereby declare that this was a successful mission. From the start, the exploration of space has been hazardous adventure. The voyage of Apollo 13 dramatized its risks. The men of Apollo 13, by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomized the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Theirs is the spirit that built America. But within a year, Apollo 14 was on its way, commanded by Alan Shepard, one of the original seven astronauts, and incidentally, the only one of the original seven who went to the moon. It was a personal triumph. Shepard had been taken off the active list because of air trouble, but had insisted on an operation which had cured him. With him were astronauts Ed Mitchell and Stuart Rooser. Again, Frau Muro was the target, but this time there were no insuperable problems, and Shepard and Mitchell took with them a moon cart to carry their equipment. They walked further than any of the earlier explorers, though they became so tired they weren't able to go as far as they had hoped. There was one amusing incident. Before departing, Shepard drove the first golf ball on the moon. He claimed that it went miles and miles and miles. I wonder whether it will ever be found. Apollo 15 was dispatched in the following July. Astronauts David Scott and Jim Irwin was scheduled to land in the foothills of the lunar Apennines, near a deep, gaping crack known as the Hadley Rill. The third crew member, Al Worden, will carry out a series of experiments in the orbiting command module. There was a new departure. With them, Scott and Irwin took a moon car, powered electrically to allow them to drive across the moon. It seems a flimsy thing, but it was designed to operate only on the moon, where the gravity is weak, and it proved to be a great success. Lunar dust was something of a problem. As David Scott told me, it got into everything, but at least it wasn't as deep as had been feared before the first unmanned spacecraft had landed. Again, ALSEP was deployed, and the view of Hadley Will was indeed amazing. Two more Apollos remained. Apollo 16, in April 1972, landed in the Lunar Highlands. The walkers were John Young and Charles Duke, with Thomas Mattingly in the command module. 
By now, the scientific objectives were increasing and more complex LCEPs were set up. The scene was set for the grand finale with Apollo 17, which was launched the following December, 1972. Up to now, the astronauts have not been specialist geologists. They were very good at it, but the fact remained that no trained scientist had been to the moon, and this honor was reserved for Harrison Jack Schmidt, a professional geologist who was trained as an astronaut and added to the crew of the last Apollo. With him was a space veteran, Eugene Cernan, with Ron Evans in the command module. We're right where we wanted to be for Station 2, and it looks like a great place. The lunar module Challenger came down in the region of Taurus Littro, near the edge of one of the lunar seas. Big blocks, it looks like quite a bit of variety from here, different colors anyway. Again, the moon car was brought into operation and the astronauts drove around. Schmidt's expert knowledge proved to be invaluable. He could appreciate the nature of the rock and the soil, and nothing escaped him. Then, inside a small crater nicknamed Shorty, he found something very strange. Oh, hey! There is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. It's all over. Orange! Don't move it till I see it. I've stirred it up with my feet. Hey, it is! I can see it from here. It's orange. Orange soil. That's the volcanic What was it? Was it evidence of recent volcanic action? Alas, no. The color proved to be due to a very ancient glassy beads. But it was an exciting moment. It's trench time. Jack, that is really orange. The time had come to say farewell to the moon. It's a rock composed of many fragments of many sizes and many shapes. When we return this rock, or some of the others like it to Houston, we'd like to share a piece of this rock with so many of the countries throughout the world. We hope that this will be a symbol of what our feelings are, what the feelings of the Apollo program are, and a symbol of mankind that we can live in peace and harmony in the future. I'd like to just let what I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. Gene Cernan was the last to enter the lunar module, and the takeoff was recorded by the camera left behind on the lunar surface. One, ignition. Run away, Houston. That's your good. Excellent. Good Big over. over. I do you have good trust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Take off through 1,500 feet. And eight dot looks good. Apollo was over. So all in all, what did Apollo accomplish? There have been critics who have claimed that anything that men can do, machines can do better. This is simply not true. A computer can't think as well as the human mind, and without astronauts, our knowledge of the moon would still be inadequate. Not only of the moon itself, but of the Earth. Remember, the moon is an integral part of our own system. Moreover, the various experiments left on the moon have been invaluable. I need only mention, for example, the solar wind collector, picking up particles sent out by the sun. Above all, perhaps, Apollo looked to the future. Since 1972, no one's been to the moon. There have been a few unmanned sample and return probes, and, of course, the American spacecraft Clementine, which explored the moon from lunar orbit in 1994 and sent back superb pictures. But the way ahead lies clear. Cost? Well, lunar missions are expensive, or so it seems, until they're compared with even a minor war. Reusable craft will certainly bring the costs down, and of course the first of these was the Space Shuttle. 
but not all of the shuttle's hardware is reusable. However, various other concepts are now being tested and will be totally reusable. So, the initial outlay may be expensive, but if all goes according to plan, the cost must be dramatically reduced in the long term. With the collapse of the USSR, international collaboration in space has increased. In 1995, Russians on board the shuttle Atlantis changed places with an American on the space station Mir. And all this leads on to a lunar base, which must surely be set up within the next couple of decades. It will be of immense benefit to mankind, and who knows where it, in turn, will lead. Wherever we look, we come back to Apollo. True, the basic impetus was political, but before the end of the program, it had turned into science. Without it, we would never have gone much further beyond the Earth. So, when we have our lunar base, and men and women are working there, never forget those immortal words by Neil Armstrong. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.